Um, so we're going to do this in two parts. Uh, Christine's going to talk about the national data service effort that we're doing here in the U.S. And I'm going to kind of touch on some of the components of that that the agencies such as the National Science Foundation are doing in order to kind of build out pieces of what would be a national data service for the U.S. Um, so with, regard, with regards to research data challenges these days, I think it's well understood that data is an important aspect to science, specifically the reproducibility of the results of that science. And without that reproducibility, it really is not, is not science. Uh, and so this spans data and software, but we're kind of really focusing on data at the moment. Um, and so when people think about data, but the first thing they usually think about is a storage, but there's also this other aspect to it that's often overlooked, and that's really you know, the everything else that comes uh, on, on top of the storage. And so the bytes alone really are, are not enough to know what, uh, what the data is all about, the knowledge, the information that's stored within those bytes. I often throw up these, these sequence of bytes up here to, and kind of ask the audience, well, you know, what does that mean? Does anybody out there have any idea what that means? Not gonna wait too long, but uh, it, it, you kind of need more information. And that's, this is just ASCII, but it, it's basically 42. It's the, you know, the, 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 the answer to the universe kind of thing from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. You, you need more information that's just in the ones and zeros. You need uh, some sort of context in terms of what that means. Uh, and so in terms of real data, what that is is metadata. Uh, and to get that metadata, you need curation tools. You need indices on large collections of data, especially unstructured data sets. Uh, you need to be able to abstract away from the storage because that changes over time. You need to be able to replicate data and all these other aspects on top of just the ones and zeros to actually make that data useful. Uh, to actually be able to use that data and to build on top of past science and build new science. And so that's really what uh, a big focus of the things that we're looking at is, yes, the storage, that's important. We need that. And we're kind of working on that as well, uh, making that available to all, but uh, also the services on top of that storage to make that data useful. Uh, so uh, from the U.S. National Science Foundation uh, aspect of things, uh, this sort of started uh, maybe, I don't know, 20, 2008 perhaps, with a number of task forces put together to kind of explore how uh, data is used within science with regards to education, with regards to visualization, uh, high performance computing and so forth. And uh, a number of massive reports came out of that and it was kind of distilled into this one report uh, called CIF 21, Cyber Infrastructure for the 21st Century. Uh, this is being updated for uh, the, uh, on the next decade really, uh, CIF 30 uh, for 2030. Uh, but basically what it, it kind of hit on were three aspects. One is uh, in order to thoroughly address, you know, how uh, data is used within science and to be able to support that, uh, several things need to be addressed. One is uh, a relationship between uh, software developers, uh, cyber infrastructure developers, and, uh, and the scientific community it needs to be there. And it needs to be a pretty uh, solid connection. Uh, it can't be one or the other. It needs to be both. And they need to be interacting and communicating constantly uh, in order to meet the needs of science. Uh, second was basically an integrated and scalable infrastructure. Uh, one, there were different pieces would be developed over time and they would kind of connect together to build larger ecosystems to do the full life cycle of what's needed for science from data creation uh, to curation to analysis to publication. Uh, no one thing would really do all of that stuff. It would be a conglomeration of, all, of several components talking to each other towards building out this infrastructure that would do that. Uh, and lastly, sustainability. Uh, these things need to last over time. The data needs to last over time. So obviously the software and tools and infrastructure supporting that data needs to last for a good amount of time as well. So uh, the idea was that this would need to be addressed in whatever is done to address the scientific needs around data. Uh, the way this manifested was in a number of awards and uh, solicitations around this, starting with uh, data net solicitation some years ago to the current data infrastructure building blocks, which are active and running at the moment, to the future uh, CSSI, Sustainable Cyber Infrastructure Awards coming in the future. And to date, there's about, in the US, 54 of these different components. The idea is, again, they're building blocks. They address some, comp some part of this research data life cycle, and they kind of build on each other. They, they interoperate, ideally, uh, and don't overlap, they're not uh, uh, redundant features, uh, towards this bigger uh, kind of picture for this research infrastructure. So in this diagram here, for example, at the base of this, you see a number of things uh, such as uh, data resources, computational resources. They could be commercial, they could also be cloud-based resources, uh, they could be uh, university resources and so forth. Then on top of this would be those services kind of things. So, so these are span a number of these DIBS awards, for example. Uh, as well as uh, past data net awards like Data One, it's one of the larger ones in the U.S. 
as well as uh, infrastructure efforts like Exceed, which kind of bring together our high performance computing resources. And then as you kind of go up, it becomes more domain specific, uh, addressing specifics within specific communities such as geoscience, astronomy, and so forth. And so the idea is all of these would kind of work together towards building out this um, ecosystem for data. So uh, from uh, NCSA's perspective, which is where I'm from, the National Center for Supercomputing Applications in Illinois, we're involved in a number of these efforts. Uh, and I'll, what I was gonna do is kind of talk about some of these and then pass it over to Christine, who'll talk about the bigger picture, which is that ecosystem kind of thing, building out that more complete um, uh, research infrastructure. So uh, at NCSA, we've been building out components of this for a number of years now. It started out with um, uh, an effort called DataNet Seed, uh, which has to do with data sharing and publication. Uh, some of the more current ones are efforts like uh, Brown Dog, which I'll talk about a little bit, uh, which is basically a data transformation service supporting uh, the data wrangling steps that happen in most scientific efforts. Uh, to uh, some of the newer ones like the Clouder effort, which uh, basically has to do with the publication of data, active curation, uh, means of helping scientists curate their data. And this builds on other efforts uh, such as Exceed for HPC and uh, the big data hubs for community building around infrastructure and the National Data Service Consortium, which is trying to address putting these all together into an actual ecosystem. So um, at NCSA, we work on a number of these efforts and uh, what we try to do is we try to overlap them in the sense that they're, we're building off of uh, similar technologies and expertise. Uh, they're not one-offs. We really try to aim for reusable components uh, and so one of the groups that uh, I'm involved with is, uh, as mentioned, uh, ISDA. Uh, and what we really focus on is uh, research and development around these components, but really emphasizing reusable. We don't want to build a one-off for one specific project. We want to build something that could be used by many projects, by many scientific domains, uh, and kind of interoperate with, uh, within, other, with, within this ecosystem that will manifest to kind of build out a national data service. Um, and so the idea is to kind of amplify any one effort by uh, leveraging past efforts, existing efforts, and so forth, uh, minimizing waste kind of thing. So uh, let me start with uh, one of these efforts, uh, and this is called Clouder. Uh, and so on the surface, uh, what it kind of looks like is Dropbox. It, it, it basically has a similar kind of layout. You basically drop files in there. Uh, you could share them with your collaborators. But it kind of goes beyond that. Its, uh, its emphasis, is, again, is for scientific research data. Uh, it's uh, really what it hammers on is this idea of making the data usable and what that means is the curation uh, metadata uh, and so allowing people to find the data that they want and being able to use the data so on the surface while it looks like Dropbox for convenience for usage underneath it it has quite a bit of features in order to support that curation uh, and so uh, what I'll uh, maybe I'll go to this slide next so the main one is that of uh, it's kind of a notion called active curation uh, and so the idea there is when you are sharing data and publishing data for science, you have to provide that metadata. The way this is typically done is at the end of the day, when you're done with your data, when you've published a paper around the data, uh, you decide to distribute that data, you upload it in some archive somewhere, and you begin the process of you know, assigning metadata. You tag certain features, you mention the authors, you mention where it came from, things like that. That's a tedious process, and many scientists uh, don't do that. Uh, it's uh, boring. Uh, it doesn't lead to tenure, typically, uh, and it's often avoided. And so this actually hinders uh, the ability to get data out there. And so the idea of active curation is to kind of help with that by distributing that curation process all throughout the life cycle of the data, going all the way back to the beginning when the data was created. And so uh, this is done in a couple of ways. Uh, one is through what's common nowadays in many archives is social curation. Uh, and the idea there is basically that as users use the data, they're able to tag the data. So not users other than the authors, they're able to assign metadata tags to the data uh, and as well as derive products of the data. And these kind of get propagated up to the original data sets. And in that way, they're sort of curating the data socially. So it's not just one person kind of thing. Um, and the other is uh, this uh, auto curation aspect where basically this is where the modern uh, innovations in machine learning really come to play. And the idea there is, especially with unstructured data sets, is as the data is uploaded, tools developed within the community using analyses of machine learning, deep learning, things like that, fire off uh, on the data. Uh, and this is specific to the different types of data. And basically what it does is it tries to classify features within the data. So this could be as simple as things like what Facebook does, you know, finding faces, uh, uh, people and images and so forth to more scientifically relevant things like uh, uploading a piece of LIDAR data and uh, determining where the rivers are. Uh, 
uh, finding the trees, uh, tracking pedestrians in a street, uh, counting the foliage in an image, uh, things like that. And basically, these things fire off and uh, annotate the data with these classification results. And this is a metadata-like feature in the sense that uh, it allows one to then sift through this data and find subsets of the data that they're interested in. And so that's what uh, this active curation uh, thing is kind of is. It's, it doesn't leave curation all the way to the end when you're done with the data where it's a big job. It distributes it throughout the life cycle so that it's a littler job. And these automated and these community processes kind of make it a smaller job yet. And so that basically at the end of the day, when you're done, you can basically uh, press a button, publish the data, where it kind of does a matchmaking service to find an institutional archive that's closest to your domain. And then it tells you what the metadata is missing and ideally, that's smaller than the original amount of metadata that you would have had to upload otherwise. So Clouder kind of fits in a space in between things like Dropbox and Box, which are all about just sharing data uh, blindly kind of thing, all the way to the publication aspects like Dataverse, uh, which is very mature at this point, and DSpace, which are all about publishing data, kind of uh, citing the metadata at the very end. Clouder kind of exists in this middle kind of space where it kind of helps you get from one end to the other. And you can use Clouder just to share data as well, or you can use it to publish data, but the idea is to kind of help uh, bridge that gap. Um, and so another aspect of this is basically the idea of supporting multiple domains. Uh, the way it does this is by being highly extensible. Uh, you can basically add new data types support. You can add new machine learning tools to kind of analyze the data and do that metadata extraction. Uh, you can add new dashboards on the top of the data to navigate the data. So this one on the left here is about basically sensors in uh, lakes and rivers uh, built on top of Clouder. Basically, as a map interface, you click on sensors, you get the data through that. On the right, it's for a medical application. So basically, these are spreadsheets with subject data in it. And it's running machine learning tools to find trends in the data. So something weird is happening here on day 61. You should kind of look into that kind of thing. Very community-specific kind of things. Uh, and then the individual data types supported, anything from um, the large microscopy images, being able to support that, to finding pieces of information within those images, like pieces of the cell. Uh, finding, like I mentioned, rivers and flood basins and LIDAR data and overlaying that on a map, uh, doing stuff with handwritten data, uh, annotating subsets of documents, uh, educational purposes, sharing uh, PowerPoint presentations and things like that, tracking pedestrians, tracking who's talking to who for social science experiments and so forth, and 3D data and so forth. And the idea is to be extensible to all those kinds of things. And as well as the publication of the data at the end of the day. So uh, one of the key aspects of Clouder, I'll just point out here and not go over this entire thing, is being able to support different community archives and repositories. So things like in the, uh, uh, university settings, like in the University of Illinois, we have Ideals, which publishes data from the University of Illinois, ICPSR in Michigan for social science data, uh, Data One for our ecological data, uh, and so forth and so forth. So being able to push uh, the data once it's published into, into those different things is kind of important. Um, being mindful of time, I'm just going to skip a few things here. Uh, Clouder has basically been utilized for a number of scientific domains, skinned for different communities to support their different needs, anywhere from small amounts of data to large petabyte collections of data for phenomics, uh, all kinds of different things. Uh, lots of different efforts within lots of different agencies, within lots of different countries. It's actually utilized in the EU and more recently in Taiwan. Um, and they also kind of kind of come together as a consortium in this new effort we're doing uh, moving forward. So the second one before I pass it on to Christine is uh, an effort called Brown Dog, and that's that data transformation service that I kind of mentioned. Again, another ideally reusable component that can fit together with other things to address that data wrangling step at the beginning of the day that researchers have to deal with. And so that has, usually has to do with finding the data that I want, converting it to the format that I want, finding the subsets that I want uh, before I can even do the research that I'm interested in. And with regards to that, uh, being at a place like NCSA where we work with lots of different communities, there's a lot of different types of data you have to do that with. Um, I'm showing the visual ones, obviously, because that's what I can show, but there's you know, lots of other things, too, that are less uh, um, visual. Um, and so what Brown Dog is is basically a service that kind of tries to offload a big part of that. It tries to deal with basically two aspects. One is the conversions, converting between format A to format B and extractions of metadata. So basically, given some raw piece of LIDAR, find me all the flood basins, all the trees, and things like that. Uh, and so in that sense, my application as a student or as a researcher doesn't have to worry about that. I could just basically call this external service that would be part of a US National Data Service uh, and have it do it for me, and, and then I could just focus on my research. Uh, and so a big part of this is being highly extensible, 
And that's actually why it's called Brown Dog. It's a mutt of software, you know, lots of different software being called in a similar kind of manner. So that's done in the same way. Uh, and so being able to encapsulate that software along with the dependencies over long periods of time is important. And then being able to access it in community uh, uh, supported applications. In that way, being, in that sense, having the main interface of this thing being an API. So that basically the other programs can call this thing and do what it needs to do in different applications. Supporting diverse languages and clients and then other aspects relevant to science such as provenance, uh, information loss, and things like that. So it, it basically what it does is random file comes in, I have no idea what's in it. Uh, basically I do a conversion to get into something I can actually open. In this case it's an image, because it's easy to show. Uh, and then basically what I do then is it's, this an image is an example of unstructured data. I do an extraction, and then I get some sort of machine readable data that I can then use to sift through large collections of this data. So we dump this out in a language called, uh, in a format called JSON-LD. It's JSON, which is a popular web way of representing information with a linked data aspect to it, so it has a semantic quality to it, so I can determine what it actually means, that data. And it spits out everything from basic data for images, like EXIF metadata, to Facebook type stuff, such as faces, uh, OCR text, if it finds text in there, to more science relevant stuff, as I mentioned, such as the amount of foliage in this image. Uh, and so it spits all this out to you, and then you can, the client application can basically decide, well, I only care about this part of it. I'm just going to filter that out and do what I want with that. So, and again, the idea is for this to be called in many different applications. This is an example in ecology, where basically it's utilized to convert different data sets into different model formats. Uh, the ecological community has many uh, models that it uses to predict things like climate, uh, carbon storage and plants. Uh, and so the idea for this uh, particular project, which is trying to compare those models, is to get the data from those different data sets into all those different models which have different input formats. And so Brown Dog kind of supports that. Uh, to tools that are commonly used every day, such as ArcGIS. So in this example here, there's a Brown Dog plugin here for tree delineation. Somebody uploaded LiDAR data to the tool. Uh, and basically what it does is it finds the trees. It just kind of bound, it puts a bounding box around the trees. Uh, this can be used in also open source alternatives, uh, such as QGIS, same kind of thing. Uh, same data, uploaded, find trees. Excel, a uh, common tool used with, within science, uh, just a spreadsheet with latitude and longitude coordinates. And there's an extractor here to the side with a brown dog plugin to find the amount of foliage I would encounter if I was to walk this path of Latin long coordinates. And so when you execute that, all it really does is, is adds to two more columns with that, basically that green index assigning that value to it. Uh, Windows Manager, uh, right click on a file, convert it, right click on a folder, index it so I can search through it and so forth and so forth. So I'm going to kind of stop there, but that, that you get the kind of the sense of the, what we're building is, I focused on what we do, we're doing at NCSA, but this is happening all around the country. Is there are these different awards to build out these different components that will ideally be interoperable uh, towards building out this bigger research infrastructure ecosystem. And that's what Christine's going to touch on uh, next. So I'll pass it off to you, Christine. Thanks, Kenton. Uh, and thank you for having me uh, and for everyone who spent time arranging this and who um, has faith that we can do this from multiple cities. Work just fine in our tests. Okay, so far so good. So a quick amount of uh, context about what I'm gonna talk about is we um, you know, are primarily funded by the National Science Foundation, um, although we, um, uh, NC, both NCSA and the San Diego Supercomputer Center um, are principally advanced computing centers that do all sorts of research, not just for our National Science Foundation. Um, but in particular, um, and can you see my slides okay? Thumbs up, Kenton, if you can. Uh, okay, okay, <laughs> good. Just making sure it looks different for, you, for me on my screen. Um, but we have two um, programs that um, provided a unique opportunity. Um, on, on the left here, you see what we call the CC star program, and that's because it's easier to say than CC asterisk, right, which <laughs> doesn't roll up the tongue. But over the last decade, there were um, a few different programs that provided high-speed connectivity, starting with, I believe it was 10 gig, and then uh, several campuses also received 100 gig connections. Um, it was uh, pretty broadly distributed across the United States, uh, including Hawaii, I suppose not Alaska, and uh, also Puerto Rico, which is uh, obviously not to scale in the bottom right there. Then we also have another um, program uh, that uh, Kent and I are both a part of called the um, Big Data Hubs program. And it split our country into uh, four regions by population. Um, we're both part of the Midwest, um, being part of NCSA. 
where it's hosted. So again, the, in, the, in the left here, you see these CC Star Awards and a nice blanketing of um, uh, the different universities in, in the country as well as the, um, the broader United States. And then in the right here, I was describing the uh, Big Data Hubs program. And so the Midwest Big Data Hub, um, Hub which is hosted by NCSA, but is um, a five institution award, it really concentrates on building people networks versus the CC Star program that built uh, real networks, uh, you know, with with fiber and such. So the um, the Big Data Hubs program tries to um, create new and unique opportunities for um, transfer of techniques and um, software uh, approaches um, in regard to anything that is. Uh, data driven of course big data being a, a bit of a deprecated term now but we're stuck with it uh, we have many um, uh, uh, regional themes of course digital lag being the midwest um, but several others and then we have some overarching themes including um, data science um, education training and workforce development and being part of the midwest we've concentrated a lot on um, bringing the, the best of the techniques from um, our research institutions and big industry partners to um, the non-R1 institutions. And I, I don't believe this is the same classification system used in Australia, but I'm sure you have something uh, similar. I can't think of the name at the moment. But basically, it just denotes institutions that um, might not put as much investment into um, uh, research, and so they don't always have the, um, the same capabilities available on site, so trying to bridge that. So putting these two uh, things together, um, the idea for an open storage network was born. And so this is a quick um, graphic of our demonstration project. Um, we are building on those CC Star Awards that brought 100 gig to these institutions. Um, and we made sure that there was a node of the network in each of the big data hubs. Um, a few of these are aspirational. TAC is a partner, but doesn't yet have a node slated and we're working on funding for PS, PSC. Um, Let's see, there's also a node at Johns Hopkins University and one at Starlight, which is a, um, a big uh, internet presence in, located in Chicago. And these were funded by the Schmidt Foundation. Um, Eric Schmidt of Google, who uh, gave money for this project because he believes that um, large universities should know how to uh, manage uh, petab petabyte scale uh, data sets. There's, this is the future, more nodes. So a uh, quick example, if you're wondering, well, what will be on this? Is it just a bunch of data? Sort of, yes, and to be simple. But here's um, uh, so a graphic that shows you a few of the different slices uh, that it might include. So obviously, things have to, uh, the network has to work. So uh, boring things like monitoring and testing scripts and such. Uh, then the part that you would expect um, replication between the nodes. Um, we're not saying that we're the custodial um, place, the custodial copy, if you will, but we do want to have some, uh, uh, you know, decent uptime and reliability. Uh, this could also be, say, an um, open uh, storage grid allocation. Uh, they have a similar uh, uh, project that they're doing with Internet2, and so we are dreaming up ways that we can join forces and um, do a bigger project uh, uh, by working together. We've also had some of our government agencies approach us and say, uh, we would really like a place to push these large data sets to. Um, some of these are located in commercial cloud, but it's become increasingly important to have places that if uh, researchers download or industry downloads it, they're not charged egress fees. Uh, then, of course, the, uh, we are not trying to duplicate what is being done well in commercial cloud. And so especially for institutions that don't have uh, commercial cloud peering, we foresee the open storage network as a, as a place that an institution could uh, get fast peering to commercial cloud, at least to that node, and then uh, a place that people on campus where speeds are sometimes only, um, uh, you know, much less than 10 gig, uh, could get their, get their files there to share and then have it um, uh, buffer up uh, as it's ready. Um, the other thing that's interesting is the idea of putting 
all of this research data um, at point of presences that already have the peering done. So see internet two would be a natural place so that you could have your, um, your data stay on the node, on the OSN node um, where your allocation is free, but um, uh, burst out say to AWS or Azure or GCE uh, as you wanted to compute on, the, on it. And then as an option, and again, this is a demonstration project, which we will be doing for two years, but we hope that it will be um, expanded to be uh, like the CC Star Awards, where institutions um, across the US will apply um, to build these, these nodes with a little bit of support from the NSF. And so something that an institution might build in is a place for um, an institutional repository. And this builds on an idea that was done successfully in Canada, where they built what they called the Federated Research Data Repository. Uh, let me just show you a quick screenshot. Um, hopefully the overlay isn't too confusing, but here I am logged into just a web interface uh, for, the, uh, for Canadian research data. Um, and you can see on the right hand side here, you can log in. This just uses your in common login. So you could probably log in. Um, any of you in the audience, you wouldn't be able to deposit data, but if you were at an institution that had an institutional repository or using something like Ketten Describe that Clouder does to help match make between um, domain repositories and your data, you could uh, put it there. And then here's what the interface looks like when I've, um, uh, this is probably uh, uh, not fair to Canadians, maybe they're tired of being associated with hockey. Last I knew they were not. But here I've uh, searched on hockey and you can see um, there are quite a number of data sets from different places and I'm not having to go to each of their websites, which is what you'd have to do now to make that work. A few other things about the um, open storage network. Um, we foresee the, there being some user facing tools, uh, some from the National Data Service, things that you might be familiar with like Jupyter Hub and Binder as well, um, as well as some uh, management facing tools. So I am from a supercomputing center, so it'd be really important for me sometime in this lecture to give you something about cores and um, uh, specs. So here's that slide. I hope you're not disappointed the whole talk isn't that slide. But basically, uh, this is the, um, these are the nodes that have already been deployed, and we're finalizing the architecture for the, nest, the rest of the network in September. Um, but if, um, it, it will probably look somewhat like this. They're basically super micro JBODs um, with some super micro head nodes. Um, we might get fancy and put some Dell ones there if we can afford it. Uh, and then a 100 gig switch from Mellanox. We expect these to be, at, given the current budget, about 1.4 petabytes usable, sorry, raw storage, which should give us a little over a petabyte usable. So what to put on these? There is, uh, well, there were enough logos to fill up this slide, and thank you again to Kenton, who has the patience to do these fancy animations. Uh, but there are so many different types of tools that people could want to use uh, to access the data, to manage the data that we'd put on the storage network, uh, to do analysis of that data. And this is where the um, US National Data Service was born. Uh, and we uncreatively call it the National Data Service, or NDS. Um, uh, so um, congratulations to Australia, who has, who has a customized name. And I uh, concede I haven't learned the new one yet either. Um, but we don't have a unified way um, that I think Australia has been much more successful. The EU has been much more successful in um, harnessing funds to, to fund something like this. We really have um, a collection of agencies that fund domain specific things, basic science. And so the idea of having a place to organize things is just very um, difficult to fund at the moment. So a group of um, academics, um, including HPC people um, at institutions like the one Kent, ones Kenton and I belong to, uh, librarians, uh, some industry people, publishers got together and said, uh, we really want to uh, be part of the data, uh, inventing the data net, and we don't have what we need um, currently for research, so let's band together. Uh, this is an analogy that comes to, to us from uh, RDA, the Research Data Alliance, which is an international organization, and actually, I um, co-chair 
the National uh, Data Service Interest Group, along with Adrian Burton, uh, who's involved in the um, Australian National Data Service. But if you think back uh, to the early days of the internet, I um, hope I'm not aging myself by uh, talking about uh, working in, the, in those early days. Actually, I worked prior to the internet, which um, was a big thing. But anyway, I, dig <laughs> I digress and embarrass myself at the same time. Uh, but I remember getting emails and I'd have an attachment and I'd have to save it and I'd have to um, switch out to an application that could read that file format. And it was a pain, honestly. And then um, uh, slowly uh, there became uh, better interoperability. We had standards and we um, just had some glue that um, uh, made it easier for those things to work together. And so now I can go into my email, I can click on an attachment and I can see a preview of it. I can even get a, um, a virus if I, if I do the wrong things. Um, but the same thing exists with the data net. There are a ton of different things, as you saw in that um, logo animation before, but they, they just don't tend to work well together. And honestly, it can be baffling to figure out uh, where they all fit in. And so, uh, again, the US National Data Service, it's, um, it tends to be very infrastructure focused, given that it's uh, self-directed, um, a grassroots effort. Uh, and it's uh, largely supported by our advanced computing centers. Um, that's why we uh, come to you today from NCSC and SDSC. But we um, exist to do three big things um, that we've uh, really concentrated on is, is the place to start. Uh, so focusing on interoperability and because we come from uh, supercomputing centers working um, at large scale, because the problems that we solve at scale uh, tend to create better solutions for the things that um, aren't at large scale. Um, we get ahead of the problems. Um, we innovate in the gaps. So in that email analogy, uh, tools can be easy to use. And some of the things we create, um, uh, as with Dropbox, um, you don't really think about the simplicity or how difficult it was to make it look elegant. A second, we're a place that you can incubate data projects and pilots, and I'm gonna show you, um, reference some examples. And it's turned out that what we've created is um, also a really good training platform. So um, we basically work within the data lifecycle to try and uh, uh, be at the intersection of the things that you need to make those programs uh, that work at various places in the data lifecycle work. This is um, a screenshot and a link to um, our most mature product, product, the NDS Labs Workbench. Um, and I'm gonna give you some more information on architecture and such. This is um, a view once you log in to the catalog uh, where you can, um, you can add a, uh, a data management or data analysis package and it already knows uh, all the dependencies, um, you know, it uses Docker, so everything is baked in, um, uh, all the knowledge about what, what is needed to run that software. And it, it's posted on GitHub, so uh, most, most of the people we work with just use our instance, but it is something that's open source and that you can download. Um, sorry, I'm moving some of the Zoom screens around so I can see my own slides, <laughs> see where I'm at. Oh, okay, so here's, uh, again, uh, just three, three ways that you can use the Labs Workbench. Um, this one is showing um, a custom uh, catalog that we created where people have the data uh, for a certain project available and they can jump out into R or into Jupyter. So here's um, a, first, a first case example with a specific, I'm gonna show you a specific project. So it's a great shared platform. Say if you've got a distributed uh, set of researchers, you want them to all be looking at the same data uh, and the same tools and you probably can't um, have someone come around and, and, and fix what's happening on that person's uh, laptop. So in this case, uh, we're working with TerraRef, and in the top right there, you can see um, a picture of the grow field, um, and that, that big thing over the top is an armature that takes uh, pictures of um, how the plants are growing, records the different um, variables in the environment, and it, uh, creates a lot of data, a lot of data, and it's a, a five-year project. And so um, by collaborating with us, we were able to set up an environment so that they could give their researchers early access to data without 
you know, hours spent, um, download this VM, make sure you have this version of Java, um, let me fix these permissions. They just log into a website, they can see the applications that are needed for that, and uh, get going. And here's a little bit more on that. I see we've got about two minutes to hit our, um, uh, our end time before questions, so I'll, I'll uh, skip through a bit. And we will be happy to make these slides available too, if that's of interest. Um, we've uh, used this platform a lot for workshops, um, training and hackathons, everything from uh, semester long courses at the University of Washington's Information School to weekend uh, civic tech hackathons in Chicago at Think Chicago this last year. And also nice, it, it does work on hotel Wi-Fi, which is a pretty common occurrence for a research conference or workshop. Uh, and it's also a great place if you uh, say you want to have a bake-off between um, a couple different data management tools or you want to see how image um, uh, metadata extraction and images can work between two different tools. Here's the architecture that I promised to show you. So it's basically all built on cloud. Uh, because we are lucky enough to have our own clouds, our own OpenStack clouds at SDSC and NCSA, uh, and there's also through our national um, exceed program, which is our um, uh, national allocation mechanism, uh, we have one called Jetstream. So between the three um, resources, this is where we posted um, the NDS Labs workbench, but it also does work on AWS, Azure, and GCE. It's all um, Kubernetes based for orchestration and primarily Docker, although because some of our um, HPC resources use Singularity for their virtualization environment, we have also run uh, Singularity containers. Uh, and one of our projects currently is figuring out the most efficient way and to see if we can do it dynamically uh, to pass things back between uh, the cloud and HPC. So I think we'll see some more with Singularity. Uh, I, I mentioned almost all of these. I do want to call out um, our first project was with the Materials Data Facility in partnership with the University of Chicago's Ian Foster, who many of you might know, and uh, also working with NIST, where we they have a very onerous um, environment for uh, all computing. And so it would have been virtually impossible for them to get something approved and an environment approved without knowing what they needed in their stack. And so they uh, built their materials research resource registry, their data curation facility on one other tool in our environment, and then applied for the um, environment that they needed at NIST and ported it over. Uh, this is one uh, last screenshot of a tool that we've been working on called Data DNS. And again, this is this idea that um, what you see is simple, but what we've done um, under the hood, if you will, is, is not so simple. Um, it runs on Girder with help from some other open source tools. And basically, uh, researchers can post, uh, in this case, very large data sets. These are all at least 70 terabytes each. Um, the one on the bottom is 200 terabytes. Post them in a place where you can um, uh, launch uh, the NDS Labs workbench to um, see their Jupyter notebook or their RStudio notebook and run through how, the, um, how their research that is documented in these publications was done. Um, and so we hope to do uh, more in that space uh, soon, also partnering with the Holtel Project um, at NCSA, TAC, and other locations. Uh, we're also partnering with GoFair, which is an uh, initiative about making your data more fair. And in, uh, I believe in 2020, the EU has a requirement to put up fair data endpoints and so there's a lot of activity around that. We're also part of the Open Research Cloud Alliance, which is um, working with NIST on the uh, Federation of Clouds standard to try and see how um, we can interoperate between clouds and push things around. And we also have some additional partners, the Midwest Big Data Hub we mentioned, and the Earth Sciences Information Partners, which is, um, was started by our, um, our, our Space Administration, NASA, and they both bring us um, projects and we act as the infrastructure and we use that to um, uh, find new and interesting requirements for products we're building. And then I, oh, okay. And I'll just skip ahead and make sure we leave enough time for questions. Kent and I hope you don't mind. I took the liberty to find a picture of you where you are smiling and very happy and welcoming. Not that your usual picture isn't that, it's just very serious. 
So thank you all for your time and we'd be happy to take questions.